it nice to be comfortable? <laughs> no? I love to be comfortable. I like to be well fed and warm or cool, whatever the case may be, right? Dry. Um, I, I like to be comfortable. I like to sit in a certain chair and uh, have the remote. I like to be comfortable. And I'm afraid that sometimes, maybe often, um, whoops, I like to be too comfortable. I, I, not I don't like to be too comfortable. I, my desire to be comfortable is too strong. I think I lose some things because of my desire to be comfortable all the time. Remember these? <laughs> that is an old thermostat. I can remember living in a house in Pennsylvania that actually had a comfort zone. And so you just dial it in there, and it wasn't too hot, it wasn't too cold, and you were in the comfort zone. And I think we lived there an awful lot of the time. I know this is true because I get a little put out when I'm in a car without heated seats. <laughs> That's a sure sign that there may be an issue, right? And now seats are cooled. It's amazing, right? <laughs> wow. In fact, I really had a hard time on Saturday and this morning because I was in a meeting on Friday and I left my coffee cup there. And I have a hard time drinking my coffee out of the wrong cup. Now that's, I know, there's a bit of being a creature of habit, but there's a certain comfort about that. It's crazy. We could all tell stories. So I like to be comfortable. And I think sometimes too much. Now comfort is just a physical or emotional ease, freedom from distress. Who wants to live in distress, right? I wonder sometimes what I lose because I want to be comfortable too much. One of the things I don't lose because I want to be comfortable too much of the time is weight. <laughs> right? It's funny. I I've, have I've a hard time identifying the feeling of hunger because I rarely am. It's more like a feeling of, in my mouth, that after I have a meal that says, okay, now you need chocolate. You get that? <laughs> Do you have that feeling too? Do you ever say you get done with a meal and you go, oh, now I just need something sweet? What is that? Wow. And so, of course, I have it because I want to be comfortable. I want to satiate those needs or feelings of needs that I have. And I live in the comfort zone. I like to be comfortably when it comes to food, comfortable when it comes to food, when it comes to room temperature. I really like to be comfortable. I like to be comfortable when it comes to um, my own sense of, you know, the people that I'm with and where I am. And I suppose most of it is control stuff. So comfort. Uh, but I'm afraid that if we're going to live a life in proximity to this God that we've been talking about, there is a sense where we have to be a little bit more familiar with danger. Now, I like to think of danger as my middle name. <laughs> but it isn't. Now, I'm not talking about danger as opposed to um, an emotional safety, okay? I, you know, when you when you use the term danger, I'm not talking about being in an unsafe place where you feel like this isn't good emotionally. I'm talking about something or someone who's likely to cause problems. That's God. Do you understand that? God is someone who's likely to cause problems. <laughs> God is, uh, my sense of this God is that he just needs to chill out some days. But this is me. Right? It's like, ah. Oh. 
I just want to be in my chair, comfortable, and have someone scratch my belly. <laughs> and I'm as happy as could be. I came across this passage from the book of Revelation. I say Revelation, and people who know anything about the Bible get this weird look in their eyes, like, oh, yes. <laughs> Ooh, what's coming next? Well, we're not talking talk about that at all. There's Revelation, and most of it has to do with what's happening right now. The last book in the Bible, it's a remarkable book. And in chapter 3, there is a section that's written to seven different churches around um, the Palestine, Asia Minor area, most of which Paul started, these little groups of people. And the letter that's written to them um, has a little bit of, okay, you're doing a great job here, and then there's a little bit of, but you could do a little bit better there. And I, I was amazed again this week as I read it, and I want to read just a part of that for you. It shows up in your notes, and um, it also will show up on the big board here. I know that you, what you have done, the writer says, and that you are neither cold or hot. That's interesting. Now, that's nice, right? That's comfortable. I mean, if it's 90 outside and you're not hot inside, that's a good thing. If it's, you know, <laughs> I'm still not used to cold around here because we don't really have it. But if it's a freezing winter day of 35 here and you're not cold, then that's a good thing, right? Well... The writer says, I know that what you have done and that you're neither cold or hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. Now, that's interesting. Now, the letter is written to this, a church in this town called Laodicea, and we have to understand some background, otherwise this makes no sense. Laodicea was a town that had two neighboring towns. One was called Hierapolis, and one was called Colossae. Laodicea did not have its own source of fresh water. And so they built Romans they were good at this, built an aqueduct from Hierapolis. Hierapolis was built on a hot spring. And when the water came from the aqueduct in Hierapolis, it started hot. But when it got to Colossae, miles away, it wasn't hot anymore. In fact, the only thing worse than hot or cold is what? Like, yeah, lukewarm. Colossae was a beautiful town, and it, they built an aqueduct from Colossae that had beautiful cold water. The problem was, by the time it got to Laodicea, the temperature of the water was no longer cold. It was lukewarm. There's nothing better than a cup of hot something on a cold day, right? Last night, Lynn and I said, what do you want to do for dinner? Soup. Right? Oh, what a perfect night for soup. Hot soup. I love that. But there's nothing better on a hot day when you're working outside or whatever it is that you're doing than something that's cold. In neither case does something that's neither hot or cold refresh you. Raider goes on. But since you're a lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I intend to spit you out of my mouth. That's <laughs> nice. Nice. While you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and there is nothing that I need, you have no eyes to see that you are wretched, pitiable, pitiable poverty-stricken, blind, and naked. Yikes, right? In other words, these people in this little church in Laodicea were saying, we are comfortable. Life is good. And someone with a perspective from the outside was looking at them and saying, you don't see yourself very accurately. One more. Therefore, shake off your complacency. That's a great word. And repent. That's a great word. What does it mean? Rethink your life. See, I stand knocking at the door. If anyone listens to my voice and opens the door, I will go into his house and dine with him. And it continues, and he with me. You ever see one of those paintings like of Jesus knocking on a door? You ever see that painting? No? Nah, I, I grew up with those things. 
We had bookstores in the Midwest, Christian bookstores, and I hated them because they were filled with what I refer to as Jesus junk, <laughs> like that painting, right? But I was taught from the time I was very young until, you know, not that long ago, really, that what Jesus is doing, what this God figure is doing, this human being that allowed God to so fill him that it, it, there was a, a union what he was doing was knocking on the door of someone that didn't have any kind of relationship with God and you could invite him in. Did you ever hear these words? Now they're going to make some of you get a rash. So just relax. You need to invite Jesus into your heart to be your own personal savior. You ever hear those words? Yeah. It's from these, this passage. You open up the door and you say, Oh, Jesus, glad you're there. Come on in. Well, that's not at all what this passage is talking about. It's talking about a group of people who have a life with God, but who have kind of become, actually, to use the Bible's own word, complacent, comfortable. And God is now on the outside knocking and going, dude, really? I've got big stuff going on out here. Let's hang out. You know what I have found? God's love is unlike any human love. Its chief concern is not to make us comfortable, but to make you free. Now, I love my wife, and I love to make her comfortable. Unfortunately, sometimes I make her uncomfortable, but that's one of the things that I think about. That's not God's job. God's job is to make you uncomfortable. Um, to afflict those of us who seem to be just fine. What do I mean by that? Well, I think what, what I mean when I say that God is like a mountain lion is that God is dangerous. The way Steph Curry is dangerous. You know what I mean? He steps on the court and doesn't matter if he's at half court or not. Right? Give him the ball, and he's dangerous. And when he goes to, to, the, to the, the basket, he may not shoot it. He's still dangerous. I don't mean dangerous as in harmful, like he's got a gun and he's going to hurt you. I mean dangerous as if your job is to stop him, that's not going to happen. He's a very dangerous basketball player. What I'm talking about this morning is a dangerous God. And I want to unpack that in a way that I hope is helpful. Because I'm afraid some of us have stopped living in a way that's engaged. Jesus said it like this. Whoever tries to save their life will lose it. Isn't that funny? And whoever loses their life will save it. Uh, that's just the kind of stuff that makes me not want to hang out with him, right? But dude, just say what you mean. I don't need these Eastern riddles. Well, this is what he meant. This is my favorite metaphor in all the world, right? I love this. If you can't see it, it's an acorn. Now, think with me here for a second. I need you to follow this. And if you don't get anything else today, you can leave right after this and you'll have all I got. In this egg corn, this is how I've been saying it lately. See if this makes sense to you. This is latent shade. Right? What has to happen to this egg corn if it's going to become an oak tree? And we've got some great oak trees in Nevada, don't we? Never seen oak trees like this. These live oaks are like grand. Well, just, let's just pretend for a second that this egg corn can talk, just for a second. And it says, yeah, I'm looking pretty good. My cap's on tight. You know, I got a nice little gleam. A lot of the other egg corns I see around me fall around. The cap falls off, you know, but I'm still all in one piece. And I'm maintaining that. And I'm, you know, I'm getting a little old. I'm maybe kind of, but I'm really hanging on. And the egg corn tries its best to maintain its egg cornness. But inside this egg corn is an unbelievable amount of latent shade. There's an oak tree in here. 
And so if this acorn falls in the right spot on the ground, or if a squirrel picks it up and buries it and then forgets where she buried it, something will begin to happen. In the moisture of the earth will soften the acorn shell. And the, and the energy that's inside here already will begin to sprout. And when that happens, the shell will crack. The cap will go flying off, really. The shell will crack and become completely obliterated. And in essence, if this egg corn loses itself, it will find its life. If it saves itself, it will lose its life. I have never heard a better description of people than that. The reason that God is dangerous is because God's job is to crack the hell out of your shell. You can say hell in church. <laughs> That's what God is doing. Literally, figuratively, every way. It doesn't feel good. It's not comfortable. Right? It's not comfortable. You go, man, I, I feel like I'm, something's going on. I'm not really feeling myself. And, and that's so good. <laughs> because when we refer to ourselves, what we're referring to is our egoic self, the self that we've had to create to survive. And some of us have had to create some remarkable selves in order to survive. We are so good at creating a false sense of self and then projecting it. We're brilliant at it. So that we forget who we really are, what God is up to in the universe is cracking human beings out of their shell. That's why God is so dangerous. God is dangerous in the sense that if you begin to get to know him, you'll begin to become yourself you'll begin to recognize and destroy your egoic self. Now this is not an easy process. It's, it's so... I don't know how I missed it for so many years, really. I missed it because I was given a whole different way of looking at the scriptures especially. You know what I mean? When you look at something in a trained way, in a certain way, it's so hard to look at it another way. You know those pictures that, you know, it's either a beautiful woman or a witch, you know that one? And you look at it and it's like this beautiful woman with the plume on her head. And I should have put it up there, but I wasn't thinking that far ahead. And you're trying to see it, like, ah, oh, I can't see it. And then all of a sudden something happens in your perspective and you see the witch with the long chin. You go, oh, now I see it. And it goes back and forth. We're trained to see our lives one way. And I was trained to see the Bible one way. And so it's so hard to see it another way, but I'm beginning to. And so these great stories, there's this wonderful story in Genesis 32. I want to read a little bit for you. It's the first book of the Bible. So we're going to last to first. This is a pretty comprehensive sermon. <laughs> Genesis 32. Man. Why, why hang out in the middle? You just go to the beginning and you're done. <laughs> Listen to this. It's a great story. During the night, Jacob got up, took his wife, his two servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the river Jabbok. He got them safely across the brook along with all his possessions. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Jacob gets attacked. And all night, there's a fight. Now, wrestling sounds nice, right? They wrestled. Now, there's a knockdown, drag out, dust up. And Jacob is grabbed from behind, wrestled to the ground, and there is an unbelievable fight going on. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, he deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. See what I'm saying? It's not, it's not just like, okay, let's wrestle, like your sons do sometimes. The man said, let me go, it's daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. The man answered, what's your name? And he answered, Jacob. 
Jacob. In the Hebrew, it means supplanter, one that cuts off others at their knees, a deceiver. Imagine naming your son that. His name from the time he was uh, earliest in his memory. Now he's somewhere in his 80s. Every day of his life, when everyone called his name, you are a deceiver. You are one that gets the better by swindling. That's what his name means. Man said, but no longer, your name is no longer Yaakov, Jacob. From now on, it's Israel, wrestler with God. Now that's a much better name, isn't it? I'd say they upgraded Jacob. <laughs> it's like, you're not going to be a swindler anymore. Now, you're going to be one who wrestles with God. Jacob asked him, what's your name? The man said, why do you want to know my name? And then right then and there, he blessed him. Jacob named the place Peniel, the face of God, because he said, I saw God face to face and lived to tell the story. Friends, listen. That story is not just that story. That story is God's desire for every human being. I want to sneak up behind you. I want to put you in a headlock, take you down to the ground, and get rid of all of the old stuff in your life and give you a brand new one. You see, that's the story. I know this is true because it happens all throughout the story that's talking about it. Moses. And Moses, almost the opposite happens. Moses is bored. He thinks that his life is over. I'm telling you, he's the perfect model of complacency. Moses thought he had this great idea. He was going to deliver his his national people group from slavery. He tried it. He failed. He ran away. And now he's just like selling used cars in Bakersfield. That's exactly what it is. Offense Bakersfield and used car salesmen. He is watching his father-in-law's sheep in the middle of nowhere, Desertville. And one day he's out walking and he sees this bush that's burning and not consumed. And he walks up to it and he hears a voice. Moses, take your shoes off. You're getting close to a holy spot. It's God. It's dangerous. Moses says, what's going on? Oh, I want you to go back and do what you didn't, weren't able to do before. I need you to do it in a different way. I'm going to re-energize you and recommission you. And Moses said, no way. I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. I do not want to go back there. Right? Face my failure. Face those people. I don't want to do it. God said, you're going to do it. Moses said, I'm not going to do it. God won. And Moses does this. This is a remarkable thing. Moses says, well, and I am getting ahead of myself. We'll we'll wait on that. Moses asks God, what's your name? And for the first time, God tells a human his name. God is dangerous in a sense that if you get to know him, you'll become, you'll begin to become yourself. That's what I was saying about Patty Taylor. I've known Patty Taylor for 14 years, and I'm watching, and not just to single out Patty, I'm watching Patty Taylor become herself. I love it. It's beautiful. And this morning, she was herself. Selfness was all over her face. It's, it's a gift. Wasn't easy, though, was it, Patty? No. When I say God is dangerous, what do I mean? I mean this. God is dangerous to your faulty belief systems. He will crush them all. If you're open. God is dangerous to your sense of identity. On and on and on. (laughs) You know, my favorite one, right, is the New Testament one. Peter shows up and Jesus is teaching and Peter says, you know what? I like what you have to say. I think I want to be one of your disciples. And Jesus says, Simon, son of John, Cy Johnson, is his name? He was a lawyer apparently. Cy Johnson, 
That's no longer your name. But I'm going to call you Petros, Peter. See, Jesus renamed Simon Johnson to Peter because Peter means the rock, the stable one, the one that's dependable. Listen, God has a new name for us. Some of us are discovering it. But th this dangerous God, if you come in proximity, your shell will begin to crack open, which is very painful and very frightening. But it's the best possible thing. Let it go. <sighs> it's dangerous to your plan. Got a plan? Let me know how that works out. Right? We love the plan. And there's nothing wrong with having a bit of a plan. But I have learned that when I make a plan, it's my plan. But when I join God in His plan, it's a real plan. He's dangerous to your secrets. Secrets that you think could never leak unless, you know, if they leaked, your ego would be killed, right? Because I want people to think a certain way about me. And so if this gets out... I'll be unelectable. Right? And so I duck and cover. I, and we blame them, but we do it. We duck and cover. We duck and cover. We duck and cover. And pretty soon the secrets are so heavy that it just feels like you need to move to a new place. He's dangerous to your religion. You know, what most religions do is they create a God of their own, and that God is impotent. If you can create a God out of your little brain and my little brain, that God is no longer God. It's, he's no, no longer big enough to do the things that gods need to do. God will destroy your sense of religion. It's not about believing. What we do, see, religion is this thing that we create. If you can think about a, think about a house framing in, right? Like just the two by fours. Can you visualize that with me? We create this house frame that we call religion. We believe this, and we believe this, and we can't do this, and this is a commandment, you can't do that, and we believe this and this, and all of these boards are going up, and we try to live in it, and we can't. You try to live in a religious house that you build on your own, it will, you will feel trapped, and you will throw it off because it's never going to work. That's religion. A sense of a life with God is you become who you are, and you live out of it. You see the difference? I don't want this superstructure anymore. I want to become myself because I'm beginning to see that God knew what he was doing when that sperm cell met that egg cell. Something happened. And it wasn't a mistake. Even if, humanly speaking, it was a mistake, it was no mistake. This force of love that binds the universe together, breathed in a metaphorical and maybe even more literal than I know way into you, and here you are. But we walk around like acorns just trying to keep it together. Man, I think your cap is getting a little loose. I could spend all day giving example after example after example, both from the, the Bible, other spiritual traditions, and contemporary life. But it's just the way life works. And so I just want to say, warning to you. God is, God is dangerous to your limits. When you say, enough, that's enough. God says, dude, we're not even getting it started yet, right? So God's like, a, we, we, another metaphor, right? God's like a good physical trainer. You ever go to a physical trainer and, and they say, okay, now give me 10 reps. And you get to six and you go, okay, that's six. And they go, no. I said, give me 10 reps. Well, I can't do anymore. God is dangerous to your fear. You're afraid, I know it. One of the biggest fears is I'm afraid that being my real self isn't going to get me contentment, peace, and happiness. And so 
I create this false self that's this egg corn, and I don't have contentment, peace, or happiness. <laughs> right? Dangerous to your addictions. Hang out with God, and even those will begin to lose their grip on you. Now, it's not easy. It takes work, and I know you know that. It's not a magic trick. Anyone who tells you, it's a magic trick. Just say the right words. Does not live a life with God. At least the God that I'm beginning to come in contact with. It's not a magic trick. He's dangerous to your entitlements. This is, I think, maybe one of God's most fun things. You go, boy, look at Joe Everly down there. He thinks he deserves... Fill in the blank. I'm not filling in the blank. He thinks he deserves this. Watch this. Watch him become more fully alive when I remove it from him. And it's going to take six or eight months or a year, but he's doing the work, and so he'll come in contact with this. He'll, he'll come to grips with it, and then he'll realize that was never really part of him in the first place. See, this isn't an easy life. dangerous to your resentments this is hard for some people because people have hurt you and you get a great deal of energy by holding on to that and you go you know what I'm uh, not forgiving that person and this thing called bitterness begins to happen and it's like a systemic poison pretty soon bitterness metastasizes and it's in every cell of your body and you look in the mirror and you can see it on your face God is so dangerous that he'll even make you let go of your resentments. People, organizations, God himself. So I just want to give you a warning. God is dangerous to whatever chain it is that chains you. And the funny thing about us is like we're the circus elephant. Right? You know that old story? They'll... And this is, this is back when there were elephants in the circus. Thankfully, there's less and less, right? But back in the day, when the circus came to town, they would pound a stake in the ground, and, and the little elephants were chained to the stake. And after a while, the trainers knew that they didn't have to chain them anymore because they were so used to not being able to go anywhere. Even when the chain was gone, they still didn't go anywhere. That's humanity. It's like the, gate, the jail cell is thrown open, and we're so comfortable in that stupid Six by five cell, eating bread and water with this horrible, I mean, it stinks in there, but we're comfortable. And so we don't know. All we have to do is take a step out and whew, oak tree. God is untamed. Doesn't that lion look like you could just cuddle up with him? <laughs> and see, that's the funny thing about God. Now, he's not going to bite your arm off. <laughs> Remember that C.S. Lewis wrote this children's story, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. You know that story. It's kind of Tolkien-esque uh, fantasy kind of animals are talking. And, and the, the, the God part of the story is a lion named Aslan. Kind of comes and goes. One of the characters, Susan, is a young girl. That's, here, that's her there on the right, talking to Mr. Beaver. Aslan is a lion, Susan asked. Aslan is a lion? I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe? <laughs> Laughed Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But, child, he is good. He is very good. Hmm. Who wants a safe God? Now, I want a good one. These Hebrew passages 
are really interesting. In one of them, the writer says, Our God is like a consuming fire. And what does that mean? It means he'll burn everything off of you that isn't you. You ever see this horror of a, you know, remember the, uh, the fire, the North Fire? And you see, they, they pan the, the area, and all you see left is a foundation and a chimney. And so everything's charred, and it just sends a shiver down my spine. Well, that's kind of like what will happen if you come into proximity with this God. He'll burn away everything that isn't you. And it won't be easy. But you will be left in the most beautiful form. I mentioned earlier, God introduces himself to Moses. And I'm going to finish up here. I love this. I love this. This is um, Yod, Hebrew letters. You, you read from right to left. That little squiggle is a Yod. And then that thing that looks like, I don't know, looks like uh, an A almost without a middle line. That's called a hey. It's a ha huh sound. And then that middle one is a Vav and then another hey. Yod, hey, Vav, hey. Yah, vech. There's no vowels in Hebrew. But they always have such clear throats all the time. <laughs> Yahweh. You know what it means? God said, Moses said, Who shall I say sent me when I get to Egypt? Tell them, Yahweh sent you. What does that mean? I am who I am. What does that mean? <laughs> Talk about the opposite of predictable. God does not describe himself. God does not tell you, I'm Jacob, or I'm this, or I'm that, and give you a name that has great meaning. He says, you know who I am? I am who I am. Deal with it. That's what God says. Now, there's a lot of ways to interpret and understand that name. It could also mean, I will be who I will be, future tense. In any case, it is the unbelievably powerful, ever-present force of love in the universe. It is the force of love between Eric and I right now. That is Yahweh. It is God. God is not an object. He is not, or she is not, or it is not, or they are not in a place that can be identified. For, for this God is everywhere, all of the time, doing everything that needs to be done for people who will say yes. That's the amazing thing about God is he will not do it without your permission. I never really understood that. Except that's what love does. God's very name embraces openness, newness, unpredictability, mystery, and danger. He will not be tamed. God is wild, unruly, and perilous. And guess what? Guess in whose image you were created. And so do not shrink back into the eggcorn shell, friends. You are most like God when you live that way. The end result is that God wants you to be dangerous. You pray with me, would you? God, thank you. Uh, thank you for this journey that we're on. We're trying our best to un uncover things that have been covered up for us. And, and they're, not un, they're not covered up for some people, God, I know that. But for me, they've been covered up. And the more I uncover, the more glad I am that you are not who I thought you were. Because I have a hard time believing in that God anymore. In fact, I don't. But as I become more fully myself and rise to the fully created heights that you've designed for me, and I breathe in who you are, I am so glad that you are Yahweh, that you are who you are. And I pray, God, as you are dangerous to the things that are not me about me, I pray that you would help me be dangerous to the things that are not right in this world 
that are in this world. Help us to live in close proximity to you. To let you wrestle all night, Father. And I pray these things in the spirit of Christ. You know, one thing about the Jacob story as I close up. Remember the last, one of the last phrases? And the man, because the sun was coming up, the man threw his hip out. For the rest of his life, Jacob walked with a limp. And I have found that that's often true of people who come into proximity with this dangerous God. It's not normally a physical limp, right? That's a metaphorical issue. It's okay to have a limp. It's okay to have scars. They don't mean that you are not perfect and that you are broken. In fact, without them, I don't think you can become who you really are. So embrace them, friends. All right. Have a great day. I'm so glad you're here. When I don't